Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it, written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing. Thank you for all that you bring forth this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you for some time messages regarding end time events and being prepared for the things that are coming. And we have another subject to begin to talk about today, which is extremely important as well. We begin in Mark chapter 13, verse 33. Take ye heed, watch, and pray, for you know not when the time is. When it says take heed, this is a command to you and me. Imperative mood, if you're here for the first time, we bring up information about tense voice and mood and, and things that are important for you to understand. This is a command, and it is present tense, meaning continuous, ongoing action. You're to continually be taking heed. You're also to be continually watching, being alert, staying awake spiritually. Again, another command, ongoing, present tense. And then you and I are also to pray. And when it speaks about praying, this is also a command to you and me, continually. And because we are praying for the things that we need to pray for for ourselves, it's going to be in the middle voice meaning the fact that you're going to pray effectively and accurately for yourself to see all the things that God wants to bring to pass come into manifestation. So we have three commands. For you know not when the time is. This is the word kairos, which means the fixed, definite time. What's it talking about? What fixed, definite time? Well, we go back and we see it's talking about the day when Jesus Christ is going to come and catch the church to meet the Lord in the air. Mark 13, 32, that day and that hour knoweth no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Only the Father knows. Notice it says the day and the hour. It didn't say the time or the season. It says the day and the hour. And so we know that this is speaking of the Feast of Trumpets because the Feast of Trumpets is the only feast that occurs on the first day of the month. And that is the time when you don't know which day or hour that it occurs because it depends upon the sighting of the first sliver, the sliver of the, of the new moon. Well, if we read on, we see really what it's talking about. Clear, clearly the day and the hour is referring to one day or the other. So we see in verse 34, the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house this is speaking of Jesus who left his house, which is the church that he founded. He's the cornerstone of it. You and I are the house, spiritual house of God. We're living stones in that house. Who gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, commanded the porter to watch. You and I have authority and we have a work to do while we are here. He said, watch you therefore. Again, commanding us to watch. For you know not when the master of the house, that would be Jesus, he is the one who is the master of the house when he is coming. And then it tells you four times. Is he coming in the evening, which would be the time of from 6 to 9 p.m.? Or is he coming at midnight, which refers to the second watch, which is from 9 to 12? Or is he coming when the cock crowing, which is the time, the word used for the third watch of the night, which would be between 12 and 3 a.m.? Or is he coming in the, what, not, the morning is not the best, but the pro -e would be the early time of the fourth watch of the night, which is from 3 o'clock until 6 o'clock in the morning. There's four watches, and they were all three hours long. So what is this talking about? It's talking about one day, which would be from 6 to 9 or 9 to 12. That would be one day. Or the next day, 12 to 3 or 3 to 6. This is clearly showing us that this is talking about one day or the other. We just don't know the specific hour. So, getting back to what we are commanded to do, this is talking about the Feast of Trumpets fulfillment when Jesus comes to catch the church up in the air. What are we supposed to be doing up to that time? As it tells us, for you don't know when this specific fixed and definite time is. So we're commanded to do something. Why is that important? Well, because we got to make sure we're taking heed 
that we're walking in the way of the Lord. We're walking in obedience. We're not sinning. We're not giving place to the enemy because the devil is going to be trying to bring destruction, remember. And he's, seeking, he's going to be seeking after the saints, the holy ones, to try to kill them. And we also need to be watching, being spiritually alert of whatever's going on. So we are always, you know, the watchman would watch to see what, if the enemy is going to show up and what to do to, to conquer the enemies that would try to come. And also pray. We've got to be praying. And you've got to learn to pray accurately and effectively. And you're going to need to do this, this is command, ongoingly up to the very time of the coming of Jesus Christ. That is important. And why would that be? Well, we've already talked about the fact that the first day of Nisan, day one, when after the church age is over, then Jesus is going to begin to open up the title deed to the earth, as we talked about in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. He's the one that opens that up. And in opening up the title deed to the earth, then he's going to begin to release the judgments. And the first one is to go conquering so that he may conquer. And where is he going to be conquering? First, there's going to be, as we've seen, the war in heaven where Michael and his angels will fight against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels. God is going to clean house on the devil and all of his evil spirits in heaven and the heavenlies. They're going to be kicked out and cast down to earth. They're going to be eliminated immediately. They prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. The great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. The whole, the world here means inhabited earth. It's not the word cosmos, it's the inhabited earth. He's deceived the entire inhabited earth, and boy, are the people out there deceived. And he was cast into the earth, out into the earth, and his angels, all the evil spirits, were cast out with him. Well, and see what, what, what we see happen. Verse 12 says, Rejoice, ye heavens, ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devils come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows he has but a short time. He's not in the heavens any longer, but now all the evil spirits are now on earth. And they're going, first of all, they go after the woman, which is the Jews, but they can't get to them because God protects them. Remember, they're going to get the gospel preached to them for the last, for three and a half years, the last half week of the 70th week of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, 69 and a half weeks have elapsed, one half week is to go, and the gospel will come, and they're going to get saved, as we see. Well, what else? It's because he's not going to be able to get to them because they're going to be taken away. And we've talked about this in the past, but here they're going to be nourished for a time, times and half a time from the face of the serpent. That's three and a half years, which is the time of the tribulation, remember. And he's going to try to wipe them out with a, a flood coming after him, but they're going to be, of course, God's going to deliver them from that. He's going to help the woman. The earth's going to open her mouth, swallow up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Well, because he can't get to the Jews who are going to be protected as the gospel's coming to them and they're all going to get saved, who's he going to go after? The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant, the remnant of her seed. Who are they? They're the saints, the holy ones, the ones who have passed the test of the judgment coming on the church and the ones who are keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus Christ. They will be after the Christians who are the saints who've come through. Well, that means that's why we're to take heed. That's why we're to watch. And that's why we got to be praying. And you've got to learn to pray effectively. We know that you must be watching because we saw this previously in Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I come as a thief. That means suddenly as he comes. Blessed is he that's been watching because he's ready. He's kept himself guarded from the enemy and conquered all the attacks of the enemy. And he's keeping his garments so the devil can't get to him. He's going to have the garments, the white garments, the righteous garments, clean and white, remember, lest he might walk naked and they, the bad guys, the evil guys, see his shame and have an open door to get to him. That's why we can't have any sin in our life. We've got to be walking in the way of the Lord and keep on the garments of God. We've got to be clothed with all of the things of the Word of God. It is absolutely essential. Now, as you do so, you're going to see that God, of course, is going to protect us. We have the promise. 
in 1 Peter 1.5 that we are going to be kept, or this is the word phroeo, which means to be guarded. You're going to be guarded by the power of God because we're going to live by the power of God. You're going to live by the power of God through the word that you're going to be hearing, doing, speaking, praying through faith unto deliverance, preservation, and safety from all enemies that would seek to attack you, prepared and ready to be revealed in the last time, this last fixed definite time that we are approaching. Well, that means you and I are going to live by the power of God. And how are you going to put the power of God in operation? Because you're going to learn to pray effectively with all prayer. This brings us to understand three things that we see from this. If we go back to Mark for a moment, chapter 13, verse 33. We take heed. We take heed so we don't give place to any sin or let the devil have any operation against us. We watch so we're always ready for any attacks that come. And we pray to put with all manner of prayers you'll see, to put the power of God in operation, to pray prayers of authority, to conquer all enemies, to take hold of every promise, as well as to be interceding and praying for others because you are going to be a vessel that God is going to use to pray and for you to be doing the mighty works of the Lord as well. We come to Luke chapter 18. And we've seen this scripture when we talked about faith. Here he speaks, When the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? And this is the last statement, the end of this parable that he spoke, in which he talks about the one who wanted to be avenged of her enemy who was coming against her, the widow, and was, went to the unjust judge who wouldn't listen, but because of her continual coming, he finally decided he was wearying me that he would grant what she wanted. And then we see that because of that, he said, hear what the unjust judge said? Then he says, shall not God avenge? He will avenge his own elect. These are the chosen ones who are the holy ones which are crying or calling out to him day and night unto him, though he bear along with them. God will deliver us. He will bring vengeance against our enemies. I, will tell, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily, with quickness and speed, this means. God will come on the scene. Well, in order to do that, what are we going to need to do? Well, the beginning of this talks about what this whole purpose, this thing is all about, the purpose of this parable. He spake a parable unto him to this end, that men ought or must always pray and not to faint. When it says here about this word die, it's translated must the majority of times, 58 times out of the 106 uses that it has. But it also is a word which really means it is necessary. It is necessary absolutely always for you to pray. You're going to have to pray continually. And you've got to become an expert in praying accurately and effectively. And this is present tense, ongoing action, and not to faint. We cannot be fainting whatsoever. This fainting means if you get wearied, you get exhausted, and you look it up in the, the lexicons, it refers to giving up or becoming discouraged or becoming faint at heart or losing heart. No, you're going to pray without ceasing, and you're going to pray to see God accomplish everything that he purposes to bring you through. In fact, when he comes to find looking for faith, he finds those who have faith will be the ones that are praying and getting, putting God in operation and getting delivered from all their enemies and not getting discouraged, not getting faint-hearted, not fainting in any situation, even in the midst of the greatest pressure that's ever known to mankind is coming to the earth. Well we see the fact that you and I must pray effectively. So we've got to learn how to pray effectively. Ephesians 6, we put on the whole armor of God with the Word in us in all the different areas, and what's, what are we going to do with it? With the Word in us, we're going to pray the Word to release the power of God resident in the Word. Praying always with all prayer and supplication says in the King James, in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. 
it literally says, this is the word dia, through all. And when it talks about all, when this is, this is the word for all, it happens to be without a definite article. When it doesn't have an definite article, it's referring to every kind of prayer, with every kind of prayer. And that's what we must learn. You're going to pray prayers. They're going to take hold of the promises and see that God bring those things to pass in our life. You're going to be prayers, praying prayers of authority, different aspects of prayers of authority. You've got to learn how to pray them all effectively so you can conquer all attacks of the enemy. You're going to pray prayers of intercession and warfare that you're going to conquer all enemies and pray for other people at the same time. You and I must learn how to pray effectively and accurately in all ways, and we're going to be talking about that as we go through these series of messages. And you're going to be praying with, it says, with supplication. This particular word, supplication, is the word deasis. It means really having strong desire with urgent need. Here it speaks of it having need. And here is this particular word that it is supplication is 1162, but it's from 1189, which I just clicked on and brought up below, which means really a, a want, a desire, a longing for something. And Young's brings out, or uh, the Strong's brings out this in Strong's Concordance. This is Strong's Concordance that we reproduce in here. And notice number 1189, that was the one that that was from. It means the idea of urgent need meaning this is the way you pray. I mean, you just don't pray flippantly or casually or, you know, if I feel like it kind of thing. No. You're going to pray with all manner, every kind of prayer, and you're going to pray with strong desire of urgent need. You're going to pray with some intensity. You're going to pray strongly with desire, knowing that what God is going to, you're going to put God in operation, as you will see. Then it says, not in the Spirit, it literally says, this is the word here, in, this is the word in, and this is the word for spirit. There is no definite article in between, so it should not be in the spirit, it should be in spirit. Because we pray in spirit when we pray what is the spirit, what is the, what is the spirit? The words, he says, my words, they are spirit and they are life. We're going to pray the Word of God, which is spiritual law. We're going to put God's spiritual laws into operation as we pray in spirit, praying the Word, because that's what causes the power of God to be resident in you, and that's what you pray. You always pray the Word to be effective. So this is saying through every kind of prayer and with strong desire of the idea of urgent need, you're going to be praying at all times here in spirit. And you're going to be watching, as we already saw, we're there unto with all perseverance. You're going to be with persistence, never getting wearied out, never fainting, never drawing back. And this deasis, again, this strong desire with urgent need for all saints. And it's the saints of the holy ones that have come through and are going to be there. That means you're going to have to become an expert in prayer. This is at the end of putting on the armor of God. You don't put the armor of God on just for you and just to have the Word in you. It's to release the power of God out of you and you do it through prayer with all different manner of prayer, which is so important. Remember that in spirit will be, you're putting that which is spirit in operation. And what do we see? John 6, verse 63 says, It's the spirit that quickeneth. That's what brings life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. The Word of God is spirit. You're going to pray the Word, and now you're putting that which is spirit into operation, or the spiritual laws, because God's laws are what runs everything. They're laws of the spirit that you put in operation as you pray the Word of God. So this is talking about through every kind of prayer, with strong desire and urgent need in spirit, according to the Word, in the realm of the Spirit, you're going to be praying with perseverance and you're going to be also praying and interceding for those holy ones. Well, that brings us to another point. John chapter 11, verse 41. This is when Jesus was raising Lazarus from the dead. 
and he was praying to the Father prior to this, and now he says a prayer to the Father for the purpose of letting the other people know so they would believe. And he says, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hast hearest, hearest me always. Oh, that's important. Jesus was heard always. You're to be heard always if you pray accurately and effectively. He wants all of your prayers to be heard. Now, not all prayers are heard. And we'll cover that in just a moment. But it's important for you to know, he said here, when he talks about this, I knew, this is a pluperfect tense verb, meaning I had known, because he knew in the past, he's saying, I had known that you've heard me, that you are hearing me always. You must have the same thing that you hear. You know that he's hearing you always. And you can't assume that he's hearing you always. It's only if you have done what's necessary for him to hear you always. And that is very important. Now, let's just answer the question. Well, doesn't God hear every person's prayer? No. Let's prove it. First Peter chapter 3, verse 12. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. And we'll mention who the righteous are in a moment. His ears are open unto their prayers. So he's hearing the prayers of the righteous. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Could you be born again and doing evil? Yes, you could, which is if you're doing sin. So if you are doing evil, the face of the Lord is against you. Is he going to be hearing your prayer? No, it's not going to go anywhere. Now, who are the righteous, by the way? When you get born again, you get a brand new spirit. You have a righteous spirit, remember, the spirit of Jesus Christ when you receive him. But does that mean that you, that means that you qualify here as the righteous just because you're born again? No, you could be walking in sin and that's unrighteousness. Are you righteous any longer? No. Who are the ones who are the righteous? Well, you have to understand that righteousness begins by getting a brand new spirit. But that's not where it stops. It continues on by doing the word of righteousness. 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. As we pointed out in the past, we'll point it out again. If it, when any time it says, don't let anybody deceive you, why would it say that? Because he's wanting to alert you about the subject that he's about to address, that the teaching that is going forth through his foreknowledge in the body of Christ is not right. Don't let anybody deceive you about this subject because they haven't been teaching you the truth. You've got to get the truth established. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness. The word doeth, present tense, ongoing action, is doing continually righteousness, as Young's brings out, is doing, is righteous even as he is righteous. Well, that means it's more than just getting born again. It's also doing the word of righteousness. And further, to make it clear, verse 10 says, In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Well, that means there's some that God considers the children of God and some that he considers the children of the devil. They must be following, one's following God and one's not. How do we know who they are? Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Well, that means if you're not doing continually the word of righteousness, present tense, you're not of God. Well, that makes you a child of the devil. You mean to tell me I could be born again, but I could be as a child of the devil because I'm doing unrighteousness and walking and doing evil? That's right, because the face of the Lord's against you. Same thing, neither he that loveth not his brother. If you don't love your brother, are you right with God? No way. Look what it says. He that loveth not his brother, he abides in death. Well, that's not having life or being saved or being right with God. No way. In fact, he says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Therefore, he's not hearing the prayers of those who are not right with God. 
they're born again, if they're walking in righteousness, doing righteousness, then he will hear their prayers. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. You know, even in the New Old Testament, it was also shown that if you had iniquity in your heart, he's not going to hear you whatsoever. We see it from Psalm 66, verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If you don't have something right in your heart, he's not going to hear you. Outside of you coming to a place of repentance and, can, and turning to, towards him, so you do deal with that sin and get right before him. So this shows us that you're also, not only do we need to be doing righteous, but we need to be having our heart right as well. That brings us to the next point we need to cover. And this is all tied into you seeing your prayers be, become effective and produce results. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Essentially, it says you can't have the talk and not have the walk and be right. No. You've got to have the walk, the fruit, the evidence you're doing. You can't just be one of those that has, says something and then doesn't do it. That's like the hearer only. No, it's the hearer and the doer of the word. Otherwise, the doers of the word, those are the ones, he says, hereby we know we're of the truth because we're doers of the word and shall assure our hearts before him, our heart will be right before him, if we are doing the word of God. So that tells you something. Your heart is only right when you're doing the word you hear. Well, that's quite a statement, but that's exactly what it's saying. How do we know we're of the truth? Because we have deed in truth, we have action. Our works are showing it forth in our life. Well, it says that then you're gonna assure your heart before him. And then he says, if our heart condemn us, well, that means it, it finds fault with us. There's something wrong here. Our heart's not right to find fault with because we've got something wrong in our heart. God's greater than our heart, knows all things. He knows what's in your heart. He knows it all. Otherwise, we're not going to be right with him. And notice he says in verse 21, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, if it doesn't find fault with us because our heart's right with him, then we have confidence toward God. So, who has confidence toward God? Only those who has hearts right before him, which would be the ones that are also doing the word of righteousness, doing what is right in his sight, walking in his ways. Those are the ones that have confidence. And what's confidence have to do with? Because confidence has to do with what you're going to do in prayer because he brings it over here. And now he says, whatsoever we ask, we receive him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. This is talking about New Testament prayer. Notice, he says, why are we going to be able to see results? Because we are keeping his commandments. Well, that's someone who's doing the word of righteousness continually, doing those things that are pleasing in his sight continually. Well, that's someone's a doer of the word. He's walking in the ways of the word of God. So, that shows us that a person's heart is only right when they're doing the word that they hear. And, as we see, they can only have confidence toward God when their heart is right and not condemning them or finding fault with them. By the way, how could your heart get messed up? See, I got a new heart when I got born again. Well, you're supposed to make sure you're guarding it and only letting the right things come into it. Because, he says in Hebrews 3.12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. You mean to tell me if I let some unbelief into my heart, now my heart's an evil heart? That's right. It's not a good heart. It's an evil heart of unbelief. And notice the effect in departing from the living God. That is quite a statement. So what does it happen if I get this evil heart of unbelief? Is it because of sin? What happens here? Exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Deceitfulness of sin will cause a hardening of heart. That's why you can't give place to sin. You've got to conquer all sin, even the so, in sin that so easily besets you, 
and you must take a stand and conquer all sin. You're commanded to not let sin have any dominion over you and not yield your members unto any unrighteousness producing sin in your life. It's mandatory. Well, let's go back to now to 1 John chapter 3. And we come to, we have confidence now so that we can pray. Now, when we talk about praying here, this brings us to another point we have to understand. When we pray, we just don't pray however we want to pray. We're well, just going to pray whatever I think. No. You got to pray the way the Word of God says, according to the covenant, and pray accurately and effectively. And this is talking about new covenant prayer. When it talks about the word ask and receive, these are important to understand. The word ask here is number 154. This particular word, what it shows here, ask, beg, call for, crave, desire, and require are all wrong. They're not the meanings of the verb, of the word. I'll tell you why. Because, look at the usage. It's been translated ask, desire, beg, require, crave, call for. Well, that's what they said it means. And that's not what it means. That's what it was translated in in the King James Version. What does it mean? This word is 154. We see let me put the arrow over it, which is strictly a demand of something due. Meaning, when I pray, I'm not going to be asking. I'm going to be making a demand of something due. Why is that? Because that's New Testament prayer. Well, What's this all about? Well, we'll come back here in a moment, but let's look at one other scripture. John chapter 16. You've got to understand, there is a change in New Testament prayer. Remember the change from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant? There's a change in the law. The Old Covenant had the law of Moses. The New Covenant has the law of Christ. There's a change now from everything in the Old Testament where they had change in the priesthood, now, it was the priesthood of, in the Old Testament, was after Aaron, the order of Aaron. But now the New, New Testament priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek, king and a priest. Everything has changed. Not only has everything changed from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, but prayer has changed from Old Covenant to New Covenant. And you actually see the two words. The word that was used in the Old Testament prayer is the word to request or to ask, or to request as a favor. This is this word, 2065, eratio. You'll see this in just a minute. The other word that we just saw, which is New Testament prayer, is this word for ask. These are not the same words. They should not have been translated the same. It is iteo. Now, let's look at these two. This is strong concordance. It brings forth exact meaning of words and this is, here they have a comparison of similar words, and they show 2065, that was that one, it was the Old Testament asking, what meant a request as a favor. But the one next one, the 154 that we saw, the second one about approaching the Father with this word, and what we saw in 1 John 3, that we'll go back to in a moment, is iteo, which means a demand of something due. You and I are going to make a demand of what is due us. Now, going back to John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. Whatsoever we make a demand of what's due us, which is what this means, and this is to be done continually in our life, but it's a conditional statement because you have to do it to see results. The reason is, is because it's a subjunctive mood which expresses a conditional statement in the Greek. The way you would translate it more literally is, whatsoever we may be continually demanding of what's due us if we meet the conditions. What conditions do we have to meet? The ones that just talked about. Our heart can't be condemnous. We have, in order to have confidence before God. And also the condition that's brought here, that we're keeping His commandments and doing the things that are pleasing in His sight. Otherwise, doing the word of righteousness, walking and being a doer of the word of God, so we have confidence in our hearts right before Him. Whatever, if we do meet those conditions, so that's one thing we do, 
then we receive, lambano is the Greek word, which means to take or take hold of, of him. When you take hold of something, this isn't a one-time thing. It is something you're doing in prayer continually because it's a present tense, and we'll be covering this as we go. In other words, this is saying whatsoever we may be continually making demand of what is due us of him, having met the conditions, we are taking hold of him, and we're doing this ongoingly because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Well, that tells you that you just can't just pray and, and think that everything's going to just come forth just because you prayed some prayer. You've got to meet the conditions, and you've got to make a demand of what's due you, and you've got to take hold of it. And we'll be talking about this demand, this due you, in a moment or so. In fact, what we should, I guess, address the fact that what are we talking about of what's due us? Well, what is due us? Everything that has been given to us in the new covenant is what's due us. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yea, yes, and in him amen, meaning firm, faithful, it's a truth, it's set. Meaning, all the promises are so. There aren't any no's, there aren't any maybes, they're all yes. Therefore, all the promises of God that have been given unto us, they're yes, and we're supposed to possess them all. Remember, we've seen this in the past, Hebrews 4.1, where it says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. We're to possess every promise. And when we possess every promise, that's how you enter into the spiritual rest of God. Having possessed all the promises, you've finished your work and come to perfection. That any of you should seem to come short of it. So we're to possess all promises. Now all these promises that have been given to us, these are spiritual blessings that belong to us. And they've already been given to us in the New Testament. Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. If he has blessed us, that is past tense. The aorist would be simple past tense. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Well, if you've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings and all the promises of God are yes and they're all for you, then what does that mean? They all belong to you and they're due you. Amen. So what are we going to do? We're going to make a demand of what's due us. Now, what does it mean to make a demand? It's a legal term according to covenant, according to spiritual law. And what are you doing? You're making a legal, spiritual demand of what's due you according to the spiritual law of the new covenant. And so how are you going to do that? You're going to see all the blessings that have been given to you, all the promises that have been given to you, and you're going to bring those spiritual blessings or spiritual promises, you're going to bring it to him in prayer, which is what? Bringing that promise before him, which is what you're going to pray, the promise. Pray the blessing that's already been given to you that belongs to you, which will be the scripture promise. So you're going to find the scripture promise that already has been given unto you. So, one of the things we see is you will see you're not going to be asking and requesting any longer. You're going to be making a demand of what is due you. Also, you are going to make sure that your heart is right and you can't be having sin and unrighteousness or having your heart being right, not right with God by not doing the word, continually keep his commandments, do the things pleasing in his sight, so you're right with him. When you meet these conditions, then you're going to have confidence that when you make a demand to what's due you, you can take hold of it because you've met all the conditions. You're keeping the commandments and doing the things that are pleasing in his sight. So that tells us we should have confidence in prayer, assuming our heart's right and we know what we're doing bringing the scripture promised him. But confidence is more than just knowing the fact that uh, my heart would be right because I'm doing the word and that I, he's, he's gonna, I can pray this demand and take hold of it. There's more to confidence than that. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. This is the confidence. Now we're talking about confidence again in prayer. This is the confidence that we are having, 
present tense again, ongoingly in Him. You're to have this confidence continually. That if we, I tell you, notice the number 154 below, make a demand of what's due us, of anything according to His will, He is hearing us. What does that tell us? That tells us that our confidence of how we know that God is hearing us is that not only met the conditions we've already talked about, but also we're making a demand of when it says anything, it's not a good translation. It really means a certain thing, which would be what? Bringing the scripture promise that is the, belongs to me because it's a spiritual blessing given to me, one of the promises of God. If I make a demand of what's due me of a certain thing, I bring a certain scripture, according to his will, it's got to be in line with the will, and how do we know what His will is? If it's the Word, it's got to be in the Word. That's why you pray the Scripture. You never pray the problem. You don't pray whatever you think. You pray the Word, which is the will of God. Then He's hearing us. So how do I know God's hearing me? If I'm praying the Scripture promise. And I have confidence because I've met all the other conditions. But what else? There's more to, more to have confidence about. If we know or have known Perfect tense verb, meaning completed action in the past with present results. We've known in the past with the results now that he is hearing us because of the fact that we have prayed in line with the promise of God, in line with the word of God, made a demand what's due us. Whatsoever we, I tell you, made a demand of what's due us, that scripture promise we brought to him, we know or, again, have known, perfect tense, that we are having, we are having ongoingly, and we'll cover this in a moment, the petitions that we desired of Him. In other words, you're having what you prayed. If you know He heard you, you know you're having it. Well, when I only know I have it when it comes? No. You know you're having it in the Spirit when you've done what's necessary for to take a hold of it in the Spirit, then it will come to pass as you continue to speak that into being, taking hold of it. Now, you say, well, you said something about not asking and requesting and, or petitioning anymore. That's right. What about this word petitions? It's the word, the noun form of Iteo, number 154. This is just number 155. It means the same thing, the demands that were due you. And what about desired? Well, that sounds like whatever I want. I can just pray whatever I want. Nope. It's the word Iteo again. Actually, the word is used four times. Three times the verb, 154, and one times the noun, 155. This is, again, so how would this be understood? Let's read back through this. This is the confidence that we are having in Him, that if we make a demand of what's due us of a certain thing, according to His will, bringing the Scripture promise, He is hearing us. I have that confidence. That's how I know He's hearing me. And if I have known that He is hearing me, whatsoever I have made a demand of what is due me, I have known that I am having the demands which I made a demand of Him. Otherwise, you know you have it. How do I know I have what I prayed? Because you've met all these conditions. You've met all the conditions. You prayed the scripture promise. You have known that he's hearing you. And otherwise, why is he hearing you? Because you prayed accurately and effectively. Not just because you prayed. We already saw, he doesn't hear everybody's our prayers. He only hears the prayers of the righteous that are according to his will in line with the word of God. So, this is important. He's not going to be hearing you pray anything contrary to the will of God. You don't pray the problem. In fact, we even see, using the same word, Iteo, he already knows what you have prayed for, what you have need of before you even prayed. We know that in Matthew 6, 8. Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you iteo him. Make a demand of what's due him. He already knows it. So why would you pray the need? Why would you pray the problem? 
That's not going to release the answer or bring the promise. You're going to pray the promise. And when you pray the promise, you are bringing it before him, making a demand of what is due you so that you can take hold of it. So your confidence is not just the fact that you know he's hearing you, but you know you're having what you prayed. You're having it. You have to get rid of this mentality. I thought I'd just have it when I, I got it, you know. No, you're having it in the spirit. And if you got it in the spirit, you got it. It's come in the past. You got to understand that's how you know you have it if you have prayed accurately and effectively. So our confidence is not only that he's hearing us in this certain demand that we have prayed, but we know he is hearing us. So the things we covered so far are these points. You need to be continually praying to put the authority and the power of God in operation so you conquer all the enemy attacks. You get guarded. He delivers you. It gives you victory all the way through to the time when Jesus comes to catch up the church because the devil's going to be out there trying to destroy you. Jesus is going to seek for the true faith. When he comes, he's going to find those who are, the, who are the ones that are in faith, that are praying without ceasing, and they're not feigning whatsoever. You must learn every kind of prayer and be praying with strong desire, with urgent need, in spirit, according to the word. Activating the word, it's going to be in the realm of the spirit to, to see the power of God be released and the promise come to pass. You're going to be doing this, praying accurately, and you're going to know that when you pray, as Jesus said, he knew that the Father heard him always. You're going to pray. You know the Father hears you at all times. How? Because you are praying accurately. You also understand the Lord's ears are open to the prayers of the righteous, and his eyes are over the righteous, and ears are open to the prayers of the righteous, who are hearing and doing the word of righteousness, but he's against those who are doing evil. Your heart must be right when you're doing the Word. That shows your heart's right. If you're not doing the Word, why not? There's something wrong. You just don't hear the Word and then just cast it aside. You're expected to do the Word, remember? You can't just have the talk. You've got to have the walk by the deed and showing the reality that you're doing the Word of God. When you're doing the Word, then your heart will not condemn you. You'll not be found any blame. You'll be continually having confidence toward God then because your heart's right. And having met all the conditions, then you can take hold of the promises of God as you, when you make a demand of what's due, you take hold of it because you're keeping His commandments and doing the things that are pleasing in His sight. And knowing that He has heard you, you know you have it. It's a done deal. When you pray, do you know it's happening? Do you know you have it? Or are you, I hope something happens. No, you're not in faith. You're not understanding New Testament prayer. You're going to take hold of it and know that you have it. You know, if you know he heard you, you know you have it. That's what it said in 1 John chapter 5. That's tremendous. Well, we've got to learn how to do this and pray effectively and accurately. As we mentioned, prayer has changed. Prayer in the New Testament is not just however you want to pray. And it's not praying for... You know, you pray in your, your problem and think that God's then going to respond to it. No, he already knows, knows that. He's going to ha you're going to pray the promise that answers the need. Not praying your problem. And it's not praying and praying and as asking and badgering away at him, thinking that maybe he'll finally listen. No, it's praying the word and taking hold of it and speaking that continually in order to bring that into manifestation, which we'll talk about as we go knowing that he's heard you every time you pray. And because he's heard you, you know you have it. It's not convincing God to give you a promise. He already gave you all the promises. You already have all the spiritual blessings. So what is it? We've already seen in 1 John 5, 14, it's in keep communicating with God according to his will, which means you're praying the word. How can I know the will? When you have the word, the promise of God, you know it's his will. It's set. Secondly, it's all going to be in spirit, which is going to be in line with the word in the realm of the spirit. You're going to pray, remember, in spirit. You're also going to be praying with strong desire and urgent need. You're also going to be putting forth the power of God that's resident in the word 
Jesus spoke everything into being by speaking the word, the spoken word released the power, and that's how he brought everything into being, and that's how you're going to bring everything into being. We saw that previously, but we'll look at it again for those who haven't seen this yet. Hebrews 1, 3. It would be in the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the rhema, which means spoken word, that spoken, the spoken word of his dunamis, power. When you speak the word, the power is released because the power is resident in the word. So that's how Jesus brought everything into being. He spoke the word and brought everything into being. That's how you are going to bring everything into being. And you're to live by the power of God, remember. Remember, now we live by the power of God by living, doing what the word says in every situation. It's also putting the spiritual laws of God in operation in the unseen realm. Now some people, again, who think that we're not under law in the New Testament have been greatly deceived. We are under the law of Christ, Galatians 6, 2. The law of faith, we talked about, Galatians 3, 27 talks about that. The law of righteousness that the Israelites could never attain to because the, you can only get to it through faith. We also talk about the royal law of liberty. It talks about in James 2, 8, which is love. We've got the law of liberty, perfect law of liberty, as it talks about in James 1, 25 and, 2, and James 2, 12 that we're judged by. These are all talking about the laws and then we have the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus in what, Romans 8, 2. These are all the laws that are in operation. You and I are under law, but this is a higher law, the laws of the spirit of the New Testament. And you and I are operating according to that and praying spiritual law and putting it in operation. Prayer also is putting forth authority and power into operation through prayers of authority to conquer the enemy in all aspects of anything that he's doing. And there's different prayers of authority. We have to learn how to put them in operation as you engage in spiritual warfare. Also, when you pray, you must understand that you are activating the high priestly ministry of Jesus because you are now a king and a priest now that you are born from above. Amen. Hebrews 4.14, seeing that we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Where is He? He's at the right hand of the Father. And so because He's in that position, seeing you have that, well, you want to put Him in operation. Remember in the Old Testament, the priests came through the high priest as they were coming to God? Well, same thing. You are the priest, and you're going to be coming through the high priestly ministry of Jesus. That's why you pray in the name of Jesus in every situation. Then it says, what do we do? Because we have this high priest up there in the right hand of the Father. Let us hold fast continually, that means ongoingly, and you have to meet the conditions of doing that if you're going to see results, subjunctive mood, our profession or confession or what we're speaking into being, which is what? The promise, the scripture promise that belongs to us making the demand of what's due us, or really speaking the things into being. We call things not being as being as we talked about when we talked about the area of faith. You're going to be speaking all these things into being. So you must understand also that when you speak anything regarding the Word of God, which would be confessing anything that's of Jesus, Jesus is going to take that and He's going to confess it before the Father. Matthew 10, 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me, he's the word, before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. The principle is this, though. Anytime you confess anything that would be of him, you're going to get confessed before the Father because he is the high priest who takes that and confesses it before the Father. If you don't, then you're going to get denied before the Father what it says. Whoever denies me for men will be denied. Also, when you confess anything that's in line with the Word of God, Jesus also does something where he puts the angels in operation. Luke 12, 8, also I say unto whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. What do the angels do? They perform the Word. They do his commandments. They hearken to the voice of the Word. And they 
minister to us the heirs of salvation, to bring forth the things that we have spoken, the promises, into manifestation. But if you deny them before men, you'll be denied before the angels. They don't automatically work. They only work if you've met the conditions. And this is why when we pray and speak the word, Jesus is our high priest, takes that and puts, goes into operation to confess it before the Father. So for the release of that promise, as we do what's necessary for that, as well as before the angels that will go forth to perform it. Now, let's point out the fact that there is a definite change from Old Testament to New Testament prayer. In the Old Testament, how did they pray? Let's look at some examples. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 28. Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which my servant prayeth before thee today. Is that a guy who has confidence in that his prayer is heard and he's going to have it? No. He's hoping he'll respond to it. He's, have respect to my prayer, please. Hearken unto my cry. Uh, I'm bringing this before you. Why? Because they didn't have a relationship with him yet. And they didn't have the promises of God that have been given to them as far as having a father-son relationship in the New Testament. They weren't in a position. They were still servants. They weren't sons in relationship. And that is important to understand. We'll get to it in a minute. In Psalms, we see another thing. Chapter 55. How they prayed in the Old Testament. Verse 1. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not thyself from my supplication. Is that confidence that he's going to respond automatically to their prayer? No. He's hoping he will. He's asking them to give ear to his prayer. There wasn't anything wrong with that in the Old Testament because that's the only way they could come to him. Remember, they were not born again. They were not in relationship with their, they weren't right with him whatsoever. There was only the one walking in line with, they could be accounted righteous, but they weren't righteous in the Old Testament era because they didn't have a brand new spirit. And hide not thyself from thy supplication. That shows absolutely no confidence as far as that they're going to have their prayer responded to and know that they get it automatically. Psalm 61.1, hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. He's asking him to, pray, to attend to it. Nothing wrong with that at that time because that's the only way they could pray. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 27 is another example. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I ask of him. They were asking, they were petitioning, they were requesting, they were asking him to give ear, don't hide from supplication, all these kinds of things. This is the way that they prayed in the Old Testament. How do we pray in the New Testament? We already saw that we, come, we have confidence in prayer to pray as a righteous one, and his eyes are over the, of the righteous, ears are open to their prayers, and we saw that we pray with confidence. Another scripture that shows us how we pray in the New Testament, because we now have relationship with the Father, and we are now seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and all the promises of God are ours, and the inheritance is reserved for us in heaven, what are we to do? Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Uh, that's not like asking him, hoping maybe he'll respond. In fact, uh, that's us coming boldly, confidently to the throne of grace, that we may lambano, take hold of mercy, and find grace to help in time of need. And that is if we meet the conditions for these things, because this, these are, again, conditional statements because it's a subjunctive mood, which is a statement referring to a condition that has to be met. Same thing with finding grace. If the conditions are met, all the things in the New Testament, our conditions have to be met in order for you to be able to take hold of mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So, how do then do we do this prayer? Well, first of all, let's look at what Jesus did. In Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to kind of run through some of these scriptures, this is how Jesus approached the Father in prayer. And he didn't approach him as God. 
He didn't approach him as Lord God. He didn't approach him as king or, or, or master or whatever. Well, how did he always approach him? As father, always, when he was praying. Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, because you've hid these things. He's praying to the Father. He's addressing him as the Father. In Matthew 26, 39, when he's even in the garden, when a little farther, farther, further fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, he's talking about if there's any other way of, instead of going to the cross and going through this avenue of death, if it be possible, let this cup, the cup of death that he was going to have to taste and drink, pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, as thou, but as thou, thy wilt. This is him, you know, praying to the, specifically to the Father. Verse 42, same thing. O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. He was committing to that. Everything he always prayed, it all we had to do with the Father. Thinkest now that I cannot pray to my Father, and he will presently give me 12 legions of angels. It was time and time again. There's many scriptures. We'll look at a few more. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is when, you know, they were on the cross. And then we come to verse 46. He cried with a loud voice, saying, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He gave up the ghost. Now, also, we already saw that scripture over in John, chapter 11, verse 41. where Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. How's he addressing him? He's always addressing him as Father, constantly. We see the same thing in John chapter 17 in that high priestly prayer. Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son. Verse 5. Father, glorify thou me. We come to verse 11. Holy Father, keep through thou own, thine own name, those whom thou hast given me. He's speaking all these things to him directly to the Father. Verse 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one. This is the things that he's praying. He's addressing the Father in every single case. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me. And verse 25, O righteous Father. So he's always praying to the Father. Now, how do you and I pray? Do we pray to God? No. Do we pray to Lord God? No. Do we pray to King? No. King is what we submit to. Lord God is who he is, but that's not who you pray to. You pray to Father. Why? Because you have relationship. It denotes relationship. If you pray to God, you're not denoting relationship. If you pray to Lord God, you're not denoting relationship. He is the Lord God and referred to that, but that's not who you pray to. Matthew, let's, see, let's look at Matthew chapter 6, and we'll look at these scriptures, some of these ones. Thou, when you prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. Who do we pray to? The Father. Verse 8, same thing. Your, your Father knows what things you have needed before you ask Him. Who are we asking? The Father. After this manner, therefore, pray thee, Our Father, which art in heaven. We pray to the Father. Chapter 7, verse 11. If you then be evil, know how to give gifts unto your, into your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good gifts to them that ask Him so who are you? And by the way, this is Iteo making a demand of what's due him for the Holy Spirit. It's what it's talking about in Luke 11, which we'll look at in a moment. In fact, we'll get to that in a second. Matthew 18, verse 19. If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, they shall make a demand of what's due you. It's always Iteo, as you'll see. It shall be done for them on my Father, which is in heaven. How about Luke? Chapter 11, this is the one you pray for receiving the Holy Spirit. And this is also a proof text that you didn't get the Holy Spirit when you're born again. 
Anybody that tells you you got the Holy Spirit when you were born again has told you a lie. You got the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, which you can't receive until after you're born again and have relationship to the Father and you receive it from the Father. Look what it says. Second part of the verse. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that iteo him? And when can you iteo someone, make a demand of what's due? Only when you have relationship and covenant with him. So you have to be already born again. Well, why would you be making a demand of him for him to give you the Holy Spirit? Because you don't have the Holy Spirit yet. Meaning you get the Holy Spirit when? After you're born again. Very simple. Why people haven't figured this out in the entire body of Christ is amazing. They want to follow traditions of men, I guess. John 15, 16. The latter part. Whatsoever you shall ask, I tell you, of my Father in my name, he may give it you. You're always going to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, as you will see. Also, do we pray to Jesus at all? No. You mean I can't pray to Jesus? Well, you can if you want, but it won't go anywhere. Because you pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. Look what it says. This is Jesus speaking in John 16, 23. In that day, talking about the day of the New Testament, you shall erateo, request as a favor, remember we saw that? N me, nothing. You don't go requesting anything of me. So what do you do? Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you iteo, make a demand to what's due you of the Father, in my name he will give it you. Why don't we pray to Jesus? Because that's not his ministry. He is the one who is at the right hand of the Father, and he's the one who takes that which we pray and presents it to the Father. In the chain of command, it's always from the Father to Jesus to the Holy Spirit in the chain of command in the Godhead. And you pray in the name of Jesus is bringing his high priestly ministry into operation where he then presents it as the high priest of the Father and he also confesses it before the angels to go forth to perform it. You make a demand of the Father. You're going to pray directly to the Father always. That is very important to understand. Also, can you ask Jesus to pray the Father for you? Nope, it won't work. He addressed that. At that day, you shall demand, I tell you, in my name, who we do of the Father. And I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. No, I'm not going to do it. You're going to pray the Father for you. He's not going to pray the Father for you. Your responsibility and my responsibility is we pray the Father for ourselves in the name of Jesus. So that's not going to work either. We've got to make sure we're praying accurately and effectively. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. He's praying to the Father. He's identifying who he is, but it's the, who's going to do it? The Father is going to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. In the next prayer that he prayed for the church at Ephesus, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he begins to pray specific things after that, how, granting them riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. We also see in Ephesians 5, verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is also, you're taught, you're praying, who you're praying to? God and the Father, identifying who He is. He's God and He's the Father. But you always do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you pray in the name of Jesus, bringing in His high priestly ministry. Colossians chapter 1, verse 3. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Who? Not to Jesus, but to the Father. What else do we do? In verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Everything that we're doing, we are praying to the Father. Verse Peter 1.17, if you call on the Father 
who without respect to person judges according to every man's work past the time you're sojourning here in fear. You and I pray to the Father. Why do we pray to the Father? Because that's who you have a relationship to. You are a son and now you're praying to the Father. You don't pray to King Jesus. You don't pray to Jesus. You don't pray to Lord God. You don't pray to God. You pray because of relationship. You never see anybody praying to Lord God whatsoever. It's not so. It's a great mistake people to have a tendency to do that. You pray from the standpoint of relationship to Him as your Heavenly Father. Now, as you're praying to the Father in the name of Jesus, we go back to John chapter 16, verse 23. Are we going to ask, petition, or request? No. Do not ask, do not request, do not petition. You can do it if you want, but it's not going to get above the ceiling. Because Jesus said out of his own mouth, in that day you shall ask, request, petition, mean nothing. And then he says, he didn't come around and say, now you can ask, petition, request, uh, request, and petition the Father. No. He tells you the change in prayer from what they did in the Old Testament to what we do in the New Testament. Why do we not ask? Because all the promises have already been given to us. Why do not we offer our petition, our request? Because they've already been given to us. Why would we ask him for something that he already gave it to us? If I gave you something, you know, you know, you, then what are you going to do? And I said, here, I gave it to you. Here it is, but you've got to come and get it. You're not going to come to me and say, hey, can I, would you please give this to me? No, I already gave it to you. You say, you said, a scripture promise, that you gave it to me. Here's my scripture promise. I'm coming to take hold of it. It's very simple, really. All the spiritual promises of God, all the spiritual blessings that have been given to us are already ours, so we don't ask Him to give us something He already gave us. Instead, we present the Scripture promise that He gave us as we're going to be taking hold of that particular promise. That's what you're doing when you make a demand of what's due you. And then, what are we going to do? It says, the Father will give it you. Not Jesus. Who's the one that's talking about? He is the Father. That's why he paid direct, prayed directly to Him. Hitherto, up to this time, this means, have you, I tell, made a demand of what's due you of nothing in my name. Why? Because the New Testament wasn't in operation yet. Jesus hadn't even been to the cross yet. He's teaching New Testament prayer, but it was still in the Old Testament era. He didn't teach any Old Testament stuff. He taught all New Testament stuff. Up to this time, you made a demand of nothing in my name. And then, he says, the next one is important. This is Iteo. Make a demand of what's due you. And he didn't say, oh, this is a good idea for you. No. This is a command. Every believer is commanded to make demands of what's due you. Not ask, petition, request. Hope maybe you'll do it. Will you hear me? You know, that kind of stuff. No. Not pray your problem. No. And present tense, you're going to be doing ongoingly, you're going to be making demands of what's due you. It's a command. And then what do I do when I just pray the scripture promise? Is that all I do? It's written, by his stripes you are healed. Does that release it to me? No, that just declared the promise of what he's done for me. Well, how do I get it? When I bring that demand to him, how do I get it to come into manifestation? That's the next part. And you shall take hold of it. Lombano means an active taking hold of. You're going to take hold of the promise. And what's going to happen? That your joy may be full because when you take hold of the promise and you see this manifest, you will have great joy. You see the healing, you see the deliverance, you see the provision, you see the wisdom, you see the answer, you see the promise come to pass. Your joy is going to be full. You have to joy. You're supposed to have joy all the time, remember. But this is going to really make your joy full because seeing the promises being manifest and coming to pass in your life. 
Making a legal demand is so important. We already saw this, and we'll look at some of the scriptures so you see this clearly. All the major prayer scriptures all use Iteo, not Arateo, a request. It's a demand of what's due you. We saw this one. Your father knows what things you have needed before you, Iteo him. You can notice it in the lower window. You're looking at number 154, Iteo. Matthew 18, verse 19. Two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall Iteo. It shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. The Father is the one who is bringing these things to pass. That's why you don't pray to Jesus. The Father is the one who is doing these things. Matthew 21, 22. All things, what things are we talking about? All things that are yours, all the promises of God. Whatsoever you not shall ask, but you, I tell you again, that you might make demand of what's due you, because you have to meet the condition of doing this, if you do this. Believing, I'm going to believe real hard. No, you don't need to believe real hard, you just need to believe. <laughs> what do you do because you believe? Just because I believe, does that mean it's going to happen? No. Your scripture says this, and I believe. Great. It's not happening yet, coming to pass yet. What do you do? You shall lambano it. See, traditional teaching says, offer up your petition, believe real hard, and you'll get it someday. First of all, if you're going to get it, it wouldn't be the word lambano, it would be the word decamai, a uh, uh, passive reception coming to you. This is lambano, which is an active reception, active taking hold of. In other words, it's giving you the instructions of what you do. All things whatsoever you might make a demand of what's due you in prayer by bringing the scripture promise to the Father in the name of Jesus, believing, you do have to believe, you shall take hold of it. I take hold of it. How do I take hold of it? With your mouth. I believe that I take hold of healing power flowing into my body in the name of Jesus. By speaking that, it's happening. It's happening. Every time you speak it, it's happening because you took hold of it with your faith to bring things into being. You are supposed to take hold. Of, look at Mark chapter 11. You're going to take hold of everything. And by the way, we don't just pray this one time. The great error in the body of Christ is that you pray one time and it's done. Well, it's true that when you pray, he heard you, but that doesn't mean that it's manifest yet. Look what it says. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say unto what things you ever desire. Is that a good translation? No. I tell you, demand of what's due you. The King James made a lot of mistakes. Whatsoever things you demand or what's due you, when you pray, believe that you take hold of it, lambano, and you shall have it. Now, we've got to look at this for a moment. This is Iteo. This is a present tense, meaning ongoingly, and it's a middle voice, meaning that you, the subject, does it for yourself. You've got to take hold of this. Whatsoever you make demand of what's due you for yourself by bringing the scripture promise for yourself. When you pray, also present tense, continuous repeated action, believe, remember we're, we have to believe, and this is not a good try your best to believe, this is a command. You're commanded continually, present tense, believe that you take hold of them. And the word receive doesn't mean just one time, oh, I did it and that was it. No. The word receive is also present tense because you're going to keep praying without ceasing and speaking that into being until it comes into manifestation. Every time, you remember, faith is always released ongoingly. You command the mountain to be removed continually. You speak to a mountain continually, whatever it might be. You cast out the demons continually until it comes out. You don't just speak one time and then just stand there. You keep speaking because every time you speak, you're releasing power and authority, and power and authority is going forth until it comes out. 
You speak to that mountain. You're releasing your faith and the power of God's going to keep on working and working until it knocks that mountain out of the way. Same thing in praying. You keep taking hold of mercy and you declare that healing powers flow into the body. You hold fast your confession. Why? Because you keep speaking into being and healing's flowing, 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 flowing into your body continually. And you keep speaking until it's done. Now some things you only have to speak one time. For instance, do I need to receive Jesus continually? No, I receive him one time. I receive him. He comes in. He's there. Do I need to receive the Holy Spirit over and over and over? No, I pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, and I make demand of what's due me, that the Holy Spirit's the Holy Spirit of promise, first fruit of my inheritance, and now I pray to the Father for him to give me the Holy Spirit. I believe I receive the Holy Spirit. He comes in immediately. Now, things that haven't happened and manifested, you pray continually until they come into manifestation. Keep speaking them into being until they happen. Luke 11. Look at all these scriptures. Every one of them are using Iteo. Luke 11, 9. Iteo, make a demand of what's due you and it shall be given you. Verse 10. Everyone that Iteo, Lambanos. Now, you got to watch some of these translations out there. Of course, the corrupted ones. You don't want to use those, but just to point one out. The Amplified, which is not based on the right Greek text. We never use it whatsoever and never will use it. It's a corrupted version. They tried to make this a little bit better because they say, if you ever read it, everyone who asks and keeps on asking. Well, they kind of got the understanding that this asking is continual. They got one good thing right but they didn't get the Iteo part. They're still in Old Testament asking and requesting instead of making demand of what's due you. But then when it came, they said, everyone who asks and continues to ask, he receives. Well, wait a minute. Well, that means that has to be already accomplished. Well, what about the word receive? No, it's not. It's present tense, meaning this is not telling you ask and ask and then you'll get it. It's telling you what you do to see effective prayer. You make a demand to what's due you and take hold of it continually because they're both present tense. It's telling you how you're praying effectively to see results. So we must, again, it uses these words again. And as we pointed out when you're for the Holy Spirit, let's bring it again, how much more we Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that make a demand to what's due them, I tell John chapter 15, verse 7. You abide in me, my words abide in you. You shall make a demand of what's due you, of what you will, as long as you can, at your will, as long as it's in line with the promises of God, make a demand of what do you, which would be according to the will. See, people think, well, can I do this at my will? Or does God have to speak to me and tell me that I can get a promise? No. He already gave you the promises. You do it at your will. This destroys anybody thinking they got to, got to hear God telling me something before I can try to take hold of it. There's a spirity attitudes that people have, which is tr totally off, off, off track. You can take hold of every promise. He doesn't have to tell you what to do to take hold of a promise because you already have the promises belonging to you because you already have covenant with him. You should make a demand of what you do, of what you will. And what you will, by the way, has to be in line with the Word of God. You can't decide, well, I'll, oh, I want this, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Give me chapter and verse for that. Well, I'll have verse. I just want what I will. It doesn't work that way. And it shall be done unto you. In fact, we'll look at another one that will show you and show you how this is wrong to do this. It's James, that is. James chapter 4. Verse 2, you lust and have not. You kill, desire to have, you cannot obtain. You fight in war, you have not. Yet you have not because you I tell not. You're trying every other way, but until you make a demand of what's due you, you're not going to see anything come to pass of the promises. And then he says, though, you make a demand of what's due you, or you did, and you didn't lombano. You, didn't rec you received not. It's possible that you could 
say all these right things, I'm making a demand of what's due me, and I take hold of it, if you've got a raw motivation. Why? Because you made a demand to do you amiss that you might consume it upon your own loss. <laughs> if it's got a wrong motivation, it's not going to work. It's got to be in line with the will of God. You've got to have a right heart for the right thing. I want a trillion dollars. I take hold of my trillion dollars. I want two yachts, two, 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 I want an island here, I want a house here, I want a boat here, you know. You want to consume on your loss. Well, I'm making a demand of what's due me. I'm taking hold of it. He told me I could do that. No, it's not going to work. <laughs> you cannot be doing things for your own loss. It's got to be in line with the Word of God. It's so important. Ephesians chapter 3. Every one of these are Iteo. Now unto him that's able or has the power to do exceeding abundantly above all that we Iteo, make a demand of what's due us or think, according to the power that is an operative, put into active operation in us. Who puts the power in active operation? You and I do. How do we know that that's talking about that? Because it's the middle voice, meaning you're the one who is putting it in operation. The subject is doing it for himself. And you do it ongoingly, present tense. According to the power that I am actively putting in operation for my benefit, middle voice, it's working in us. Because you're going to, and you're going to put the power of God in operation because you're going to be speaking the word, see? You say, well, you told me we're not supposed to request anymore, but I remember Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made unto God. Well, let's find out about requests. Could it be erato, that one we saw that was asking and requesting? No, it's number 155, itema, which is the noun form of iteo. So it shouldn't be translated requests. It should be translated to demands. That are do you. And by the way, you do it with thanksgiving. Why do I do it with thanksgiving? They always told me, pray, believe, you receive, and then after you get it, then thank him. No, you start out with thanksgiving. Why? Because it's already given to me. That's why you don't ask for him to give it to you and then believe you receive and then thank him afterwards. No. That's the, that's the word of faith teaching, which is total error, thinking you got it one time, now I'm going to thank from then on. No, you start out with thanksgiving. Notice it said, with thanksgiving, you let your demands be made known unto you. Why do I start out with thanksgiving? Because it's already been given to me. You gave it to me. Thank you. Your word declares thank you as I take hold of it. So you're making it with thanksgiving. That's why you make an I, uh, a demand of what is due you. How about when you're praying for Wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Colossians 1.9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire. Does that mean whatever I want? I tell you, demand of what's due you, that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That is, if you meet the conditions of making a demand to what's due you. And of course, you've got to be right with God, too, remember? And you've got you to do it with all the right, right motivations. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him iteo of God. Not request, make a demand of what do you. Wisdom is one of your prom promises that belongs to you. You can take hold of wisdom. You can have wisdom as a promise of God that gives to all men liberally, and braideth not, shall be given him. But let him, I tell you, make a demand of what's due you in faith, nothing wavering. He that wavers like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. And let not that man, if you're wavering, even though you brought, I brought the scripture, but I'm kind of wavering on it, and I'm taking hold of it, but I'm still kind of wavering, are you going to get anything? No. Notice it says, let not that man think that he shall lambano, Take hold of anything of the Lord. You can't take hold of anything if you're wavering. Well, if you know he heard you, why would you waver? 
if you know you have it because he heard you, what's this wavering stuff? You should never waver, ever, because you understand what New Testament prayer is all about and how you're taking hold of things in the realm of the Spirit. We already saw in James chapter 4, we saw in 1 John 3 and also 1 John 5 already about ask, ask, we're up both Iteo and then the petitions was Itema and the word desired was Iteo, making a demand to what's due you in every case. Every one of these cases, I'm going to show you one more before we stop. This is one that has stumped some people because it's implying that you pray to the Father, but it didn't say that. And it's also revealing what Jesus does, not what the Father does. Because Jesus has a part to play in seeing things come to pass. Look what it says. Back, we, we back up for a second. He says, believe I'm in the Father and Father in me. He's talking about the Father. He believes, in works, believes on me the works that I do. He'll do greater works or more in quantity than these because I go to my Father. And whatsoever, he's continuing on, you might make a demand of what's due you in my name. And who are we always praying to in his name? To the Father, right? That will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Why is the Father glorified in the Son? Because the Father is the one who's going to perform it. But Jesus is also involved in it because he's the high priest who's going to present it to the Father and confess it before the Father as well as before the angels to see that it gets done. In other words, Jesus is going to see that what you pray in his name gets done when you make a demand of do you that the Father might be glorified because Jesus has a part to play in this thing by presenting it to the Father and also by confessing it before the angels that go forth. So he, the, he's part, the Godhead is involved in it. The Father and also Jesus is involved in seeing these things come to pass. The next verse is, if you shall make a demand of anything in my name, or a certain thing again, this means, I will do it. Meaning, he has, he's going to be involved in it by confessing before the Father and before the angels. Now, one last thing. The translations, if you have translations other than the King James or New King James or any of the ones that are Texas Receptus like Young's Literal, you're going to see something different. New American Standard, English Standard Version, NIV, NLT, all these. Look at this. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Actually, when you think about it, it doesn't even make sense. I'm going to ask him, but I'm going to do it in his name. That's like redundant. Yeah. You don't do anything to him in his name. If you did it to him, why would you be doing something in his name? You'd be doing it directly to him. That wouldn't make any, that's, that's, that make any sense. Why is this in here? Because of the corrupted version, the Westcott and Hort. Although he even must have figured it was, because notice, even in the Westcott and Hort, he's got it in parentheses. Maybe he was thinking, well, maybe this shouldn't be in there. Otherwise, there'd be no reason to put parentheses on his Greek text whatsoever. But that's where it come from. This, they stuck this me. It doesn't make any sense at all. And that's what all the other translations say. And that's how they come up with justify. See, we do pray to Jesus. Ask me in my name. It's wrong. It's error. It's redundant. It doesn't even make sense. Who do you pray to? By the way, it's the Father may be glorified because who are you pray to? The Father. You're making a demand of what's due you of who? And the scriptures don't have any contradiction. We already saw, for verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you make a demand of the Father in my name, he will give it you. See, his part of doing this is to see that this comes to pass by doing his part as a high priest. Confessing it before the Father and before the angels. So he has a part to play as well. And that's why you hold fast your confession. See, and you have Jesus as high priest. He was at the, as passed into heavens. What's, why is that important if I'm praying to the Father? Because Jesus has a part to play with it, play in it. He's confessing it before the Father and confessing it before the angels to bring it to pass. So I want to bring that out to you so you understand that. But well, we've covered a lot of things and went over a ways. 
but I trust this has helped you. We're going to cover more tonight. We're going to talk more about all the, other, the many other aspects of what we need to do for accurate New Testament, effective prayer that's going to produce results. And you must learn to pray all these things. We're going to cover all these aspects of prayer so that you will come through victorious. And remember, whenever you pray in line with the Word and He hears you, you know you have it. It has nothing to do with what you see or feel or what's manifest. It all has to do with what you've done in the spirit. You know you have it. And then you keep speaking that into being, knowing you have it, which is releasing that to continually come to pass in your life. That's why you hold fast your confession, speaking it into being. The speaking into a being is a continual application of your faith to bring that into manifestation because it may not have come in immediately. If it happened immediately, then there's no reason to pray. But if you're continually speaking it, it hasn't come, you keep speaking it into being until it does come into manifestation. That's why you continually pray without ceasing. And the scripture says, we'll talk about how we pray without ceasing and not stop until we have finished and seen the results come to pass. Say this, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father. I thank you and praise you, thank you, and praise you. for the understanding of accurate New Testament prayer, I see it is imperative that I pray accurately and effectively all the way from this day forward until Jesus comes so that I am releasing the power of God, bringing the promises of God into being, conquering all enemies, seeing the angels go into operation, seeing God accomplish everything up to the time when Jesus comes. I thank you that I will pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. And I will pray scripture, promises, making a demand of what is due me. And I will take hold of the promises, speaking them into being. I thank you that as I pray accurate New Testament prayer, I will see results and I understand I have this confidence that what I am praying that he is hearing me and when I'm praying and I know he's hearing me I know I'm having it I thank you I will know that I'm having it from this day forward if I know he's hearing me not based on whether it's come to manifestation, but it's because he has heard me. Because I know he's heard me. I know I'm having it. And it's coming to pass. And so I keep speaking, holding fast my confession, declaring what he is doing, bringing it into manifestation. Thank you. I will always meet the conditions for accurate New Testament prayer. I will have my heart right. I will never allow anything evil in my heart I will be doing righteousness keeping the commandments doing the things pleasing in his sight so I'm always right with God so then the eyes of the Lord will be over me the righteous and his ears will be open to my prayers and again when he hears me I know I have it thank you for understanding accurate New Testament prayer, I will pray and I will see all the promises come to pass. I will be like Jesus. I thank you, Father. I know you hear me always. I'm going to see all the promises come to pass. Thank you for the truth. I'll be a hearer and a doer of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for this revelation that's so important to help us all learn how to pray accurately and effectively and come to the place where everything we pray, we always have it. He always hears us. We know it's coming to pass. We're putting the power of God in operation. We'll see everything come to pass and we will, through praying the Word of God and all manner of prayer, govern every situation by the power of God and through the Word of God to see everything come to pass like Jesus did all the time until, until the coming of Jesus Christ to catch us up to meet Him in the air. Thank you. 
for us praying effectively, accurately, and seeing continual results all the days of our life. We thank you for bringing this to pass. In Jesus' name, amen.